Welcome. I'm Robert Green. I'm the host for this edition of uh, the Momentum TV show, and we're happy to be joined today by Mr. Gilroy Chow. Mr. Chow is a 1965 industrial management graduate from Mississippi State University who played a key role in the Apollo 13 mission. Uh, the MSU Television Center has recently produced a documentary about the Apollo 13 mission and the role Mr. Chow and another one of our graduates, Ed Smiley, played. So we're happy to have you here. Welcome, Gilroy. Glad Thank you're you. here. Thanks for having me and uh, happy to be here. Oh, and it's, it's been a pleasure. We've, we've had you on campus all day today and uh, you've got to meet some interesting people. We have some good conversations. So tell me, how did uh, someone like you, you, you were born in Cleveland, Mississippi, moved to New York, uh, came back to school here at Mississippi State. What brought you back to Mississippi State? Well, I had a conversation with my cousin who is from Cleveland also. He had gone to school up north and decided he didn't like it. And he said, uh, we need to come down and I need to take a look at uh, Mississippi State and see if uh, that would fit what my goals were. And uh, I came down and he transferred to another school, and, uh, but I came anyway. Well, good. We're, well, we're glad you did. So after you graduated, you, you went and you got involved. Uh, I believe your first job was with Grumman. Is that correct? I, I did. My first job out of school was with Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation. Can you imagine uh, that? Uh, it has since evolved to Grumman Aerospace and north of Grumman now. But uh, Grumman was building airplanes on Long Island uh, from World War II days. And uh, they had an opening. And uh, I started there. Once I started there, uh, went from airplanes, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, work on the lunar module, the first spacecraft built to operate entirely in space and no earth constraints. And so that was where I started uh, my first uh, workaday world was at Grumman Aircraft. That's great. And of course, the lunar module, as you said, it was the first real spacecraft. And I believe that was the th only the third mission actually going to the moon, and of course along the way, um, there was an explosion, caused a little bit of excitement, uh, and instead of landing on the moon, the lunar module became essentially the lifeboat. How, where were you and, and what were, was your reaction when you first heard about the explosion on Apollo well, 13? Yeah, uh, uh, the, the nature of the task is we uh, built, Grumman built the lunar module in Bethpage, New York, with parts from all over the country. And then uh, the ascent and the descent stage were shipped to uh, Kennedy Space Center on the pregnant guppy. It was a plane that was modified to take large objects. And so it was shipped down as the ascent and descent stage. And then we assembled, tested, and checked out and added any modifications, uh, late modifications, uh, down at the Kennedy Space Center. And so uh, it, it came down and uh, we, we, we did our, our role. And then once we put it in the SLA on top of the Saturn V, um, our job was finished. And we would get ready to process the next lunar module because uh, the original schedule had us doing a launch every four months. And uh, that was the plan. But for 13, um, the, uh, I got a call in the middle of the night that said, there's been an explosion on board, and you need to come in to see what we can do. Normally, our roles were finished. But here, uh, they wanted all the expertise they could gather. And so uh, we went into the office, into the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building, the MSOB. Uh, the back bays and the uh, ACE equipment, the automatic checkout equipment, was where we would monitor a mission. But our, our, our role at that time was to monitor only, but here, unscripted, they needed all the help we can get. So the, uh, the propulsion people got together, the guidance and navigation, and the ECS, the environmental control system. So my uh, department manager assigned me to ECS, and uh, so we started to devise ways to, to see how we could help. And that, that was how my direct involvement. So, of course, you got involved in really figuring out how to take the lithium hydroxide canisters from the command module and use them in the lunar module because they were, they were different shapes. Uh, different shapes. How, was, how did that process work? Well, uh, this was one of those things that uh, they designed them differently. Uh, they they uh, 
Hamilton Standard was the vendor for the uh, ACS, uh, but uh, they said, well, we, we don't want to, to mix them up and, and we just, uh, each one would have their own storage locations and these would be command module and these would be lunar module so that it was a square peg, classic square peg in a round hole. But uh, in some regards, uh, the solutions were simple in that you had to work with what you had. And we knew exactly what they had up there because we had loaded the spacecraft in Florida before uh, launch and flight. And so uh, he said, this is what we've got and this is what we've got to do to, we've got to do something to make it, make it work. And uh, that's, that's how we got involved. So I know you mentioned in the documentary that um, the movie Apollo 13 has some drama in it and it didn't really happen exactly like they say, but how many trials did it take uh, of you and, and the team going through to figure out how to get something that would work? Well, it, it, it took several iterations, uh, as did most problems. Uh, you rarely solve things the first time around. You, get, you might get close or not so close, but uh, here we got reasonably close, but then uh, the, uh, the idea of using the plastic was fine and the tape, but then it would collapse. And that's where somebody came up with the idea of using a piece of cardboard to make a tent over it. And then uh, the suit hoses were in there because you had to have a smaller orifice to make, make the air flow properly. And uh, so you, you had to use what was there. And so that was truly a, 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 a given um, materials, but then you had to come up with a solution and uh, the ECS team was able to do that. And we were talking at lunch, we were fortunate that they had a roll of duct tape on, on board the, the spacecraft. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so, th th of course, this happened in the early 1970s. Um, things were different back then. We didn't have the internet. Uh, and as you mentioned, you were working in Cape Canaveral, um, having to get instructions to Houston to get to um, the Apollo spacecraft. What sort of communication difficulties were there in trying to get these very precise instructions through that many channels so that uh, your design could actually be constructed? It was, it was actually telephone conversations. You, 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 know, uh, you would talk to somebody with a pencil in your hand and try to sketch up what you were hearing. And uh, that was the magic, because uh, of course, Capcom, uh, the system was the, the capsule communicator was always an astronaut, and usually from the backup, uh, the support crew. You had prime crew that actually flew the mission, a backup crew that could go, just as uh, Jack Swigert filled Tom Mattingly's slot, slot, and then you had a third crew called support crew. The support crew would typically be the Capcom, and with three members, uh, they could rotate around the clock to, uh, to support a mission 24 hours. But they had to tell, and in this case, uh, Jack Swigert ended up putting it together. And the ironic thing is, up until the explosion, Jack Swigert had never been in the lunar module. His, his role had always been command module pilot, and so he stayed in the command module, and he trained in the command module, even though he had two simulators on the ground, uh, four simulators, a command module and a lunar module, one in Houston, one in, uh, e e of each in uh, Kennedy Space Center. And so, uh, and uh, actually, uh, I heard uh, Harrison Schmidt said, as soon as he heard about it, he went to the simulator to get inside and to uh, develop some of the calculations to get the guys back. So everybody has a different memory and a different perspective of where they were and what they were doing to help because it took the whole team to make an, effect, an effective rescue with this new uh, job of the lunar module to serve as the lifeboat uh, to uh, take the place of the disabled uh, service module. Uh, of course, Fred Hayes was the lunar module pilot, um, and Fred Hayes is also a Mississippi native. You're a Mississippi native. Were you aware of that at the time you were working on this? And if so, how did it feel to have one person from Mississippi essentially saving the life of another? Well, uh, that's a perspective I didn't have to later in life. Um, 
Fred Hayes, of all the astronauts, is one of the most personable to uh, work with in person. And he was one of the first astronauts that I met. I've met others at different times. You didn't meet all of them all at one time. Everybody had a different job and a different place. But uh, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, Fred is from Mississippi and that I'm from Mississippi. And uh, even to this day, uh, you can't get to the moon without going through Mississippi because at the Standard Space Center, all the uh, rocket engines to propel uh, people to the moon are tested in Mississippi. But uh, there are other people that have come from Mississippi, other state grads that have uh, been a part of Apollo and other missions. Um, one of the uh, people, most interesting people that you want to meet at a later date is Tony Sang. Tony is from Rosedale, Mississippi. He's just retired from NASA uh, a few months ago. He's gone to work for SpaceX. Tony's career, he had to learn go to Russia to learn to speak Russian because he spoke to the cosmonauts and he spent a couple of years in Russia speaking with the cosmonauts uh, for the Mir program, which preceded uh, the space station, of course. But uh, yes, Mississippi uh, is uh, the birthplace of many people who have helped us get to the moon. Yeah, I'd certainly like to, to be able to talk to him. We're getting close on time, so I would like to ask you one last question. Obviously, this was an important part of your life. You, you mentioned the Apollo was, was only seven years, but uh, out of this particular part of your life, what lessons did you learn that you're now passing on to your children and grandchildren and would, would like to share with others? Sure. Um, I learned uh, that uh, it takes teamwork to get a job done, especially a massive task, but even small tasks, sometimes it's easier when you have somebody to help. And you have to learn what their skills are. And so you have a relationship with people so that you understand them and they understand you. And uh, the, the relationships that you form, even at work, uh, the, the, uh, the task of getting along with people, even with technical skills, will uh, take you a long way that uh, the relationships that you form and keep and the bonds that you make uh, are important. So uh, I think uh, besides the technology, very important, but the organization it took to send men to the moon and get them back, uh, I think uh, the leadership that did that for us uh, is a lesson uh, to be well applied to any uh, phase of life, any season of life that uh, you want to, uh, to uh, get along with the team and to work together to accomplish uh, set goals. And uh, that, that, that's a lesson that I would give to anybody, my family, friends, and uh, work colleagues. Right, that's a very good, good lesson to have. I want to thank you for taking the time to come visit with us uh, today and join us on the show. Um, for those of you um, in the audience, uh, we will, you can watch the video uh, 13 produced by the MSU Television Center uh, online at films.msstate.edu. I highly recommend it to you. Until next time, I'm Robert Green. Look forward to seeing you on the next edition of Momentum TV.